Hey, welcome everybody. Okay, first of all, uh, <laughs> I'm gonna try to tackle something that I haven't done in a very long time. So please bear with me. Uh, I hope that the live chat will keep me honest on this particular video. Uh, if they see any mistakes, as usual, point them out. Uh, I will try to fix them in real time. I did make this presentation yesterday. I think I, I got mostly correct. <laughs> we'll, we'll see as the uh, the presentation goes on. But we're going to kind of do a basic intro to integrals, uh, which are antiderivatives. We're going to be doing uh, what's called um, uh, indefinite integrals as opposed to definite integrals. And I'm going to do a little bit of review from some of the other videos that I've done on some of the differential calculus that we've done and, and how to do uh, differentials and things like that, or basically derivatives. Uh, and so there's going to be a little review here, and I wanted to get a little bit of the concepts out of the way because uh, integral calculus is hard. Um, I didn't get very far in it, uh, so I am definitely not the person to be doing this presentation. I will tell you up front with that, so if that's uh, not okay with you, go go find somebody that uh, really knows it better. You're probably better off. But I'm going to tackle it anyways because people had asked me to. Uh, so I, I kind of want to start off with basically some conceptual things of what a cal you know what an in, uh, integral is uh, as opposed to a derivative. And uh oh, I just had a computer problem here. So let me see. Am I still on? Hopefully it's still on. Um, I don't know. But uh, let me know in the live chat. So let me start off by basically kind of re-explaining a little bit of of a function and what we're going to be trying to do with relationship to a specific function. And by the way, if you cannot hear me, please let me know. But if you can't hear me, you wouldn't be able to tell me that anyways, because you couldn't hear me. See how logical reasoning works? But all right, so let me start off with, with Desmos. Um, this is just a random function. This is just some function that produces a sinusoidal type wave. And what I wanted to try to explain to people really briefly, if you take college algebra, you'll learn all about this. But basically what happens is when you take a derivative at a certain point, like here, you're taking the slope of a tangent line at, at one point of that function. Okay, so if you if you take a line lower and higher, you're going to end up with a secant line. You're going to end up with two points of this line. But if I if I take this line that would normally be a secant line and just kind of move it to it only hits one point, right? It's going to be a tangent line, and this tangent line will change slope as you move up and down the function. So you have a relative minima here called a extrema, and you have a relative maximum here, and you can tell on both relative maximum and minimum the slope of the line is going to be zero. These are called critical points. And then right here, you have a, a, a type of a critical point called an inflection point that changes the concavity of the function, right? You hear, see, this is concave up going up here. This is concave down. So at this point, you have what's called an inflection point. The way you determine these is a first derivative test, which basically tells you if you're going to be, uh, if your function is going to be uh, uh, extrema. And then you take the second derivative, and the second derivative happens to have a, a change in sign, like, uh, this, if you take the second derivative of this function here, whatever that might be, you would find that right here has a change of sign on the second derivative, meaning that it went from concave up to concave down. And you can tell that the slope right here is actually at its highest, right? The slope right here is at the greatest on this particular function. And you can actually see this more with something a little bit simpler that I just kind of made up with. Uh, let's just say I have a little basic parabola, right? Everybody's taking parabolics and, and quadratics by now, probably. So if you have a function like here, I have a, a a parabola with just a shift on the y-axis, right? x squared minus 1. And so I'm just shifting this down one to, to negative 1 here. And if you notice, when you take the derivative of this, you're going to end up with a straight line. So if I take the derivative, and again, this is a little bit of review. If you haven't taken the derivatives yet, you're probably not going to understand this video. So go back and watch my videos on derivatives. Hopefully this will make sense. But the derivative is the time of change with respect to a position on the on the function. So at this particular point, right, where my vertex is, right, where the parabola actually intercepts the y-axis, my slope is going to be zero. Um, actually, no, the slope's not going to be zero. That's not correct, actually. I mean, I see I made my first mistake. Uh, but uh, it's going to be intersecting zero. That's what it is. Because the slope is going to be basically, well, actually, no, the slope is going to be zero, zero. Yeah, it has to be. This this isn't the slope of this function. This The slope zero, zero, zero is the slope of this. This would make sense. So the slope at, at negative one here, right, is going to be a straight line that goes across here because that is the point where the parabola changes from going from the left side here, approaching, to the right side and going back up, right? So, so this intersection at the zero 
which is going to be at zero, uh, zero, zero here on the first derivative. This is the first derivative of this parabola is going to be zero uh, with respect to this function here, the x squared. So what we're going to be kind of doing is working with uh, integrals or called antiderivatives. And what they are, um, again, I'm not going to get into the, the what's called, uh, 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 yeah, can't think. Uh, I'm not going to get into uh, proper and improper integrals, okay, that, that deals with, with if you have an infinite maximum and you're trying to find something that has an, uh, a boundary condition that's going towards infinity, um, we're not going to really get into that much. We're going to be talking about indefinite and not and not definite, though. Definite integrals we will eventually get into. I'll do, try to do a video on that, but a definite integral just briefly would be something along the lines of this equation here, right? Um, and by the way, this is the same equation for indefinite, just that you have boundary conditions where here it would be negative one and one, for example, and that'd be like this shaded region right there, right? So if I wanted to find the definite integral with the area underneath that curve bounded by these conditions, right? Bounded by the x squared minus one and the x axis here, right? And by the way, this, this um, uh, inequality here, right? This relationship here, if I didn't have the equal sign, I like Desmos here, what it does is it, it does this. It actually shows you by a broken curve, broken line, that that is not the boundary condition, right? But we to find the actual area underneath the curve, you want the actual boundary condition. So this would be a definite integral from negative one to one. Again, that gets in the second theorem of, of calculus and some other stuff, which is going to be outside the scope of this particular video. It's going to be intro, but I just want to show people that we're the difference between a definite and indefinite integral. Well, the indefinite integral is going to be basically is that when you have a function, like this particular function here, okay, see this function here? This one-third x cubed minus x plus some constant, right? Doesn't matter what the constant is. Uh, when you take a derivative of that, you're going to end up with x squared minus 1, if you remember, right? Because the derivative of a constant is 0. The derivative of, of negative x is going to be just 1, right? And the derivative of 1 third x cubed, when you use the power rule, bring the 3 down to here, the exponent down to the coefficient. 3 over 3 is 1. And you subtract one from the coefficient, which is two, would be two, so you end up with x squared minus one, right? So this right here, this function, it, uh, actually this, here we go. This function is the derivative of this function, right? So this would be the antiderivative, right? If this is the derivative of this one, this one has to be the derivative or antiderivative of this one. So the derivative of the x squared minus one, you could do again, right? Which would be right here. And you end up with two x. Right, and by the way, Desmos doesn't do the calculations for you, but just to show you that it is the would be the second derivative with respect to this one, or the first derivative with respect to this one. It's a, it's going to be two two x, right? And oops, we're not going to get into that one yet. Um, and the reason I, I wanted to point that out was merely because it's important to understand when you have integrations, you're doing a family of integrations, you're doing a whole collection of them. Because when you take a derivative of this particular formula here, or this particular function here, right, uh, you lose where what c is, right? C could be anything. C could be one, two, five, ten. It doesn't matter, right? Whatever you take, whatever you take the derivative of this function here, you're going to get x squared minus one, regardless of what the constant is, right? It doesn't matter. So if I take the antiderivative of this, I'm going to get a whole family of possibilities because the constant could be anything. So the way I kind of, I, I, I figured in Desmos to show the, how that would work is just basically do this. If I get the derivative, which is gonna be x squared plus, uh, if I take the, oh, me, if I take the uh, derivative of x squared plus c, right, I just end up with x squared, no matter what c is, all it, oh, let me move this, all it does is shift the function up and down, right? That's all it does. Right, so all C does, right, if I have x squared plus C, is just change the vertex of where it is on the y-axis, right? Everything else stays the same, right? If, if you notice right here between z negative one and one, right, and if you bound the boundary condition of the x-axis, so this part of the curve underneath the x-axis, axis, uh, axis, <laughs> um, you'll notice that that will be the same if I go a little bit higher, if I just put the vertex at zero, right? This area here, only here you're moving it up to, to negative one, one, and here one, one. But the error is gonna be the same if you just have this as a boundary condition, right? So the parabola is exactly the same. All you're doing is just finding a family of uh, basically 
antiderivatives that will be possibly the case for this derivative. So if I did, if I took uh, x squared plus c, right, and I take a, a der derivative of that, I'm always going to end up at 2x, right? So if I take the integral of 2x, I'll get x squared, but I don't know what the original constant was, right? So we call that the constant of integration. Okay, so that's gonna be very important that whenever you do an integration, or I'm gonna say almost always do the, you, you put the constant of integration as. Eventually you always will. At the very end of everything, you're always gonna have a constant of integration if you do an integral. But during integration, a lot of people skip it. Um, and a lot of people will just do this. For example, if you have two integrals on the left-hand side and the right-hand side of an equation, and you take the integral on both sides, you're gonna left with a constant one on the left-hand side and a constant two on the right-hand side or vice versa, or however you wanna index them is irrelevant. But constant plus a constant is a constant, right? So it doesn't matter if you add the constant in while you're doing these problems. They don't really care that much. Technically, it is the case. But the reality is you really just wanna put the constant in at the very end, right? Because you, again, you don't know what the original function was to get the derivative that you, you, you got from it, right? So if I take the derivative of x squared plus c, we all know that's gonna be 2x. But now if I want to take the antiderivative from 2x, okay, sure, it's gonna be x squared. You're gonna to have to trust me on that right now, but uh, we'll get into that. Uh, but we don't know what the constant of integration was. We don't know what the constant was originally. So we just have to, like, is it literally an infinite number of c's it could be, right? I mean, infinite number. So that's kind of what I wanted to at least get out of the way at the beginning here, because I think that kind of helps to understand why we have a constant integration and what we're gonna be doing as far as indefinite uh, integrals, as we're, as opposed to definite integrals, where we have a range, a boundary that could, we're looking for, an area underneath the curve. Here we're just looking for a family of solutions, right? So, all right, let me take a quick pause on that. If any got questions on that in the live chat, I see a lot of people out there. I'm surprised. Again, this is nothing that I have done in a very long time, so I do need my coffee. And if I'm butchering this, for those out there who know about this stuff, like Tom, Tom, and I think even uh, Mr. Sirius does. Uh, please correct me, because <laughs> uh, I don't mind being embarrassed on this stuff if I'm wrong. Uh, but I do like to try to explain these things in a way that makes sense to me. Um, and if I can explain it to myself, how these things work, then hopefully I can explain it to somebody else. And if one person even says, man, that makes sense now. I never thought of it about that way conceptually. Then it's made a difference, OK? So, so let's dive into the actual presentation, uh, intros, intro to integrals and to derivatives. As you guys remember, the power rule for derivatives, right? Uh, we went over that in one of my other videos, derive the power rule and the chain rule. Uh, so the power rule for the derivative is d over dx and x to the n, uh, nx raised to the exponent of n minus one. And if you remember, d over dx is basically a, a differential of sorts, right? dx means a very small amount on the x-axis, right? A change in x, right? So when you when you do a differential equation or you do some kind of mathematics with derivatives, d, dx uh, is basically saying you're trying to take the derivative with respect to x for some small portion of x, right? And, and you know what's funny is you're actually, if you get into physics a lot, you'll see this stuff in physics quite frequently because of what's called principle of least action. And the principle of least action uses a, what's called a Euler-Lagrange formula to basically take a local uh, snapshot of, a, of something to kind of come up with a global way of positioning things, right? Because in physics, you take kinematics, you always want to be able to determine what's this, take a state of the system from initial conditions and see where the state's uh, going to end up given some boundary condition, right? So if you know the initial state of, of, of a system, and you know the function of a particle as it moving through some kind of field or free space or through gravity, it, it doesn't matter. They all use these Euler-Lagrange formulas. Um, then uh, you can actually predict where a particle is going to be. Right? So again, for like putting in, uh, something into orbit, uh, unless you're a flat earther, they would use something along these lines because they could determine where the, the position of that satellite is going to be with respect to its launch given certain conditions, right? Now, it's a little more obviously more complicated than that with open mechanics and, and thrust and all this other stuff, but the basic principle for particle and free space is that if you know the initial conditions and you know the path that it took from, or you, you know the initial condition and you know this last position, you can actually see what kind of path it took. Um, and that's because of what's called the, the principle of least action. And getting into action and Hamiltonians 
Uh, and all that stuff I'd like to do one day with an actual physicist because I find it fascinating, but outside my skill set, even though I took physics. But uh, all right, so let's dive, kind of dive into this. So, so you'll see these derivatives everywhere, right? This is what I'm saying. Math is ubiquitous. And, if, and so the power rule here basically saying that if I want to find the derivative of x to the n, I'm just subtracting one from the exponent, moving the exponent to the coefficient, right? That's it. This is one of the easiest things in the world to do. So if you have x squared, right? And I want to find the derivative to x squared. I subtract 1 from the exponent, which 2 minus 1 is 1. And then I move the exponent to the coefficient, which is 2x. Now, x to the first is clearly just x, right? So 2 to the, uh, 2x to the first is 2x, right? Now, uh, everybody understands that, I think, right? So, I mean, uh, again, I know you guys are way beyond this kind of level, so this is what I'm saying. Don't mock me too much. But for people that never had this stuff, they might, might be not unfamiliar with it, right? They may never have the power rule. So, so this is actually going to be very integral, <laughs> get the pun there, very integral to doing int integration because there is a power rule that we'll be talking about for integration. So, again, for example, t d dx uh, x um, cubed means to find the derivative or the time rate of change of a tangent line at that point for any point on the on this point uh, at least here's uh, any point on the function x cubed right there are ways of finding tangent point or at each, each each individual points matter of fact if you watch my last video i kind of explained that find the slope of a tangent line given a function at a given position that is actually taking the derivative at the at, at a specific point on that function so here the example of the the uh, derivative of x cubed, okay. Well, three minus one is two. Okay, so I got my exponent. I know it's x squared, and then I just move the exponent down to the coefficient. So the derivative of x cubed is three x squared, right? All right. So this is like a little bit of a review here. Um, also, there's different types of notation you can use for um, for doing a derivative. Uh, there's the dot notation. This is Newtonian notation. You can use the um, Leibniz? No, this is actually, excuse me, this is the, uh, 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 oh, this isn't Leibniz. This is this is Leibniz notation. This is no Newtonian, this is Leibniz, and this is um, Lagrange. That's what it is. So th if I remember correctly, I I'm pretty sure that this is Newtonian, this is Lagrange notation with the F prime, and then Newtonian is D over DX. So Newtonian is actually the easiest, I think, to use when doing integrals. You're also, you're, you'll see Lagrange like this, and occasionally when you're doing physics, you'll probably see the dot notation. So this would be the derivative of x, the first derivative. If you had two dots, it's the second derivative. If you have two primes, it's the second derivative. And for the Newtonian, it would be d squared dx squared, right? So and then obviously for third derivatives, et cetera. So these are different types of notations. Um, and I got to tell you, when I took calc, I really wish I would have understood that there was different notations because I learned, you know, first graphical calculus which is like Desmos, right? We did a lot with graphical calculus. And it was it's basically this kind of notation, Newtonian uh, notation. And trying to look at something from a different notation, like F prime or F dot, and you're not familiar with the notation, it's very confusing, right? So I kind of wish that, uh, somebody had explained to me there's a lot of ways of saying the same thing. Um, so anyways, uh, Integration as an indefinite integral for finding antiderivatives. Okay, so this is this is kind of explaining that if you have a, a capital F here, the function, uh, which is going to be an antiderivative. So the antiderivative, right, x, uh, is uh, if you take the derivative of the antiderivative of x, you end up with a function. Okay, so if you have uppercase here, it generally means that you're going to be using uh, integrals, but not always, right? There are different types of, of math where you use capital F. So don't get too fixated on that. Yeah. And by the way, yeah, I think Newton did use the dot notation. Um, yeah, that's what I'm saying. This is Newtonian. Uh, as uh, Well, um, excuse me. Yeah, this is Newtonian. This is um, Lagrange. And this is Leibniz. I'm sorry. Right. So the DX, D over DX is Leibniz notation or Leibniz. I, I think it's pronounced Leibniz. Um, and then Newton used the F dot. You'll see this more in physics. Right. Um, if you see F dot X then you know you're dealing with the first derivative. Like for example, uh, velocity is the first derivative with respect to position, right? Uh, acceleration is the second derivative with respect to position or the first derivative with respect to velocity. 
So you'll see that notation because it's just a lot easier to use because you're not manipulating a lot, lot with the DY, uh, DDX in certain things with physics. So you'll see the dot notation because you just want to know, look, if, if I, if I want to represent something as um, the, the velocity, right? Well, I just write it to the dot notation knowing that it's going to be the first derivative with respect to position. So, all right, so anyways here, so the derivative of, of, of the integral uh, is going to return the function, right? But the way you would write this was, is with this S symbol, right? This is actually, a, a, it's supposed to be a summation symbol, right? This is actually, I think, where the, the S derivated from. And if you get into, you actually get into more in calculus, people out there taking Calc 2, I think Bombard out there is, you'll, 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 you'll definitely understand um, that integrals and summations are intricately related, right? Because what you're doing is you're taking the, the area underneath the curve by using what's called, uh, we used what's, uh, was it the Newton method and there's Riemann. And basically you just, you're just adding up smaller areas. And when you do uh, an infinite summation, or if you do a basic summation with boundary conditions, then the summation of that is gonna be equal to the integral, right? Because the integral and a definite integral is gonna be the area under a curve, right? So there's a, there's a very distinct relationship between uh, summations and integrals. And if you haven't watched my video on summations, uh, go watch it. Again, I have a whole playlist of math videos. I thought I did okay with the summation one. Um, I actually was a lot more comfortable doing that than I am integration, so. Let me know what you think of the um, integration video. Um, I'll, I'll include this in that playlist when I'm done. All right, so, so if I take the integration of a function, I end up with the capital Fx, which is gonna be the antiderivative, plus some constant, again, because we don't know what the original constant was, which uses a family of constants. Uh, same thing as derivative with respect to dx is gonna give me dx with some constant. Uh, integral of du is gonna be u with some con You know what, this isn't right, this is x with some constant. Oh, I saw my first error, and nobody caught it. You all, fa you all failed me. Um, so this is, <laughs> this is uh, integral of dx is gonna return x plus some constant. Integral of du is u some constant. And you'll see these often when we, uh, I, I, I made a small little thing on what's called integration of parts. I might go over it depending on how much time we have or it might be a separate video, but you'll see a lot of dx du with integration of parts and substitutions of variables or what's called change of variable conditions. One of the reasons why you have those things is because integrals get complicated astronomically quickly and it's almost impossible to do an integral on certain functions the way they are written. Uh, and even if you do what's called substitution of variables, it's still nearly impossible in some things. And you have to have integration guides. You have to have, I mean, it's just, the, the, if you go look on the internet, you'll find uh, these, basically you look at the form and, look, and the form will tell you how the integration will actually look in, in form because it's just so complicated. Um, I used one the other day. Uh, it was like, uh, what was it, one over, uh, a square square root no wait wait I think it was a one was it square root of one over a squared plus u squared or just one over a squared plus u squared I believe yeah I think it was a square root of one over a squared plus u squared it ends up being like one half arc tangent of of, of uh, u over uh, x or something it's like really messed up right but anyways we're not gonna get that far into it so I. Uh, uh, yeah, you're definitely going to have to use uh, uh, integration by parts and change of uh, substitution, change of variable substitution, uh, somewhere down the line. It's just an, you just have no choice. There are many different ways to do integrations. That's one of the most common, but it doesn't always work. All right, so the concept is that every function has a family of antiderivatives, okay? And let me kind of explain this conceptually. Again, um, I wrote all this um, to as I explain things, right? I wrote this how I picture things. So a lot of this you're not going to probably find anywhere written in the same way. Uh, because it's just kind of things coming out of my head to try to explain. Um, all right, so so given a function of x squared, then if I take the derivative of x squared, we all know it's 2x, right? I don't think there's any problems with anybody there, right? We beat that into even Flurfer's head, right? Because I, Flurfer's always like, oh, we know calculus. And I'm like, uh, okay, what's x squared? What's the derivative of x squared? What's a derivative? Okay, let's move on. So, I mean, that's kind of a litmus test because that's like the easiest derivative to take, all right? X squared is just 2x. You can't get much simpler than that, except for maybe derivative of 2x, which is just 2, right? And the derivative of 2 is 0 because the derivative of a constant is 0. So those are all pretty easy. So given the function x squared plus 1, right, if I add a, if I add a constant here, right, and that's just where I'm shifting it on the y-axis, right? In this case, the parabola is going to shift upwards as opposed to the negative one that I had on Desmos that shifted it down. Then uh, I can actually split these, right? I can actually say 
Um, it, then the derivative of x squared plus one, and by the way, I probably should put that into parentheses so it's easier, but um, actually, you know what? No, actually I shouldn't. I mean, another, another mistake. Uh, see, I catch this on the fly. There we go. I try to split these up. There we go. Uh, the, the derivative of of uh, the derivative of, D, uh, of uh, x squared plus one, actually, you know, let me actually write this correctly so it's not as confusing here. Uh, so let me see. This is like real time stuff. You see this? Um, equals. Uh, uh, my keyboard. All right. The x, x squared. And then plus. The, yeah. By the way, if you don't know this program, this is called Libre Math. It's really good for this stuff. And then one. Okay, there we go. That should work. Right. Perfect. Now, I highly recommend getting a Libre Math, um, Libre Office Math. It's free. It's it's easy to use. There's also a what's the other version? There's the um, uh, Microsoft Office version, but LibreOffice is free. This also, what, what's the other one? There's it's LibreOffice and uh, eh, I don't remember. They're both pretty similar. All right, so what I just did here was the derivative of x squared plus one. And yes, if you want, really want to be like end in here, I'm gonna put this the way it should be. That way, there's no confusing. Uh, let's see here. There we go. This to be the quantity, that right? Uh, so let me add this. There we go. This is why. This is how you know you're taking the derivative of this whole function here, right? So let me uh, do this. See that? Now I know I'm taking the derivative of that whole function. So the derivative of this whole function, I can split into parts, right? This is called the uh, rule of sums, right? So we've run over this before. So I can split this as the derivative of x squared plus the derivative of one, which is going to give me two x plus the derivative of a constant zero. Open office, thank you, Les, Lex. Open office. I couldn't think of the name. Damn it. Yeah, it bugs me. You know, it's like right on the top of my t t t t t my tongue too. And I have used open office. I do have it, and I've. I find very insignificant differences between the two. If you can use one, you pretty much figure out the other one. Um, and yes, I use Wolfram Alpha as well, but I use Wolfram Alpha to basically check my work. Um, I've checked all this, I think, um, except for that little boo-boo right there, but I've checked most of it to make sure that I do get the right solutions. So Wolfram Alpha is very good for that. All right, so anyways, um, given that I have x squared plus one, then I'm gonna end up with two x for the derivative, right? Because the derivative of a constant is zero, so I end up with two x plus zero. And if I, had, if I had two, Right, the same thing, right? Derivative of, of, yeah. I have to make the same error here. This would be an equal sign. And the, I don't mind fixing this stuff on the fly. This means that uh, I can show you how it's done over dx and 2. There we go. Easy fix. All right, so the derivative of x squared is going to, you know what, I'm going to save this too so I don't make that mistake later. There we go. So uh, the derivative of x squared is going to be 2x and the derivative of 2 is a constant, so I end up with 2x. So basically, for any constant, d over dx x squared plus c is going to equal 2x, right? You guys see that? So it doesn't matter what your constant is, right? It's going to go away. So the derivative of, of the antiderivative of the derivative of x squared is just 2x plus a constant, right? Because the antiderivative of derivative cancel each other out, right? So if I take the antiderivative of a derivative of x squared, right? Because the derivative of x squared is going to be 2x, and the antiderivative of 2x is going to be uh, x squared plus some constant, right? So this is going to be a whole family of functions here, right? Because the integration of 2x dx is... Uh, by the way, I will explain why this is the case for integration. Okay, I haven't got that far yet. I understand that. This is kind of a lead end to that. So the in, the integration of 2x, which is the antiderivative, gives me back the original, which is x squared plus c, right? So basically, 
This is to help people understand that an antiderivative is basically just that. It's the opposite of derivative. It takes the derivative and gives you back a function plus some constant, right? That's what an integration is basically doing with indefinite integrals. Uh, you might actually see it like written like this, d over dx, 2x plus c. And again, I probably should put these in parentheses so there's no ambiguity here. Um, there we go. Um, you can also see it written as this, which is basically um, derivative of 2x because it doesn't because x goes away, right? I mean, it c goes away, so this is all equal to each other. And you'll see that it's written in these del, what's these called del symbols. These are used for partial derivatives. Um, which in this particular case is a derivative. So the derivative of two X over C with respect to X uh, is equal to, to derivative of two X with respect to X because it's the same thing. Wolfram Alpham does it this way to break it down. And you're also seeing them written this way when you're working with vectors and working with, the, there's another symbol called Del two. I don't, I don't know why these symbols are called the same thing. I've never, anybody knows why? Uh, but the, the upside down triangle is called a Del. And if I remember correctly, these little symbols are called Dels or D if I'm not mistaken. Um, I probably should have looked into that. I, I just call them partial derivative symbols, but I think they're still called DELs. But uh, uh, if you have if you have the upside down triangle as a DEL, that actually is three partial derivatives with respect to x and y z axis, right? So if you're a particle in free space and that particle's changing position with respect to x, but not with to y, or changing position with respect to y but not to z, right? Then you can hold two variables constant and der do a der derivation of the third. You would use partial derivatives for that. Yeah, they're multiple multiple variables. So when you have multiple variables like x, y, and z, right? We had, we had actually had to do this, um, you know, um, in nuke school and tr explaining, okay, given certain conditions, I'm holding these conditions constant, but I want to derivate this third position. What actually do you do? What, how, how do you how do you do that with respect to only one variable, right? Uh, if I again, if I'm moving along the x-axis, but I'm not changing y or z, I don't need to do a differentiation with respects to those variables. So these are for multivariable calculus. Um, uh, you, you again, it gets really complicated really quick using Dell. You kind of see them in Maxwell's equations, and then you will see them in uh, again uh, using what's called the principle of least action, because you're dealing with uh, vector spaces, you're dealing with tensor mathematics, you're dealing with uh, six degrees of freedom, which would be left, right, up, down, and then X axis, I guess, right? Um, so uh, you use one symbol, the del symbol, to kind of represent all those different degrees of freedom and all those different uh, variables that are in your system. And then it gets more complicated when you add another variable like time, right? So you end up with four variables because now you have, you have your partial derivative with respect to Z, X, Y, and then you also got your time, which is your independent variable, which, by the way, um, there's a flat earther out there that doesn't understand what an independent variable is. Go explain to him that time is almost always, not always, but almost always an independent variable in physics. Um, your dependent variable is what you put into the system. Your independent is what's not. And time is going to be your independent variable because that's what you're trying to figure out when you're trying to find a path in free space, even with like the path integral formula, whatever you're using for your mathematics to derive where something, a part, position of a particle is going to be, you have to put in the information you know, which is usually your velocity, right? You, you, most of the times in physics, you have your mass and you have your velocity, or actually technically you use your position. And then you derivate with respect to that, right? So even with something along the lines like force equals mass times acceleration, which is a vector quantity, dealing with the acceleration of multiple different positions, because you're dealing again with forces on the X, Y, and Z axis, then time is going to be your independent variable on that. All right, but anyways, we're sidetracked on that, but that's, that's okay. That's what we do. I want people to be exposed to this stuff, right? Because there's, there's a, there's a brilliancy, uh, is that even a word brilliancy? I'm going to, I think so, uh, of, of the way these things have a conciliation to each other, right? They all have a consilience, right? And so when they say that, you know, how, how does this work in, in mathematics, the, uh, in physics, then, then you break, break off the math. Uh, yeah, this is using curl. Yeah, curl is for a Gaussian field, right? I mean, if you have a particular uh, tensor field and you have a, a, a particle in that field, curl is going to give you, um, using partial derivatives, uh, and I forget the formula for it, and if I'm not mistaken, it's the actual, the, based on the torque of, the, uh, of a particle in a, position of, in a position of a Gaussian field right or some type of gradient right so in a magnetic field the curl is going to tell you the torque of that particular tensor if i'm not mistaken right it's been a while lex again but i like that i like that quiz me um 
Wow, we're going off topic. All right, let's get back into uh, let's get back into integrals here. All right, so the power rule for integrals. Again, this looks kind of familiar, right? I mean, this looks very similar to the power rule of derivatives. The only difference is is that instead of subtracting one in the integral uh, the uh, exponent, you're adding one, right? Because again, this is the antiderivative. So you want to do the opposite. You want to do the opposite. So the only difference here is you, on the denominator, you actually do the, you just take the exponent and you add one to it, okay? So the inter, this is called the symbol of integration, sign of integration, or I think is, um, again, based upon, it is based upon, if I remember correctly, uh, summation. Um, this is called your integrand, your x to the end, and this is what's respect to, right? This is your, um, your dx is what it's gonna be in respect to. And, and this is for any, for any n was an element of the real numbers, okay? So this is, only works for real numbers, this is a condition. You'll see, uh, double, this is normally like a double strike R for reals, all the set of reals. If it was C, it'd be complex. Uh, and by the way, all reals are a set of complex numbers, but um, if it was Z, it'd just be the integers. If it's Q, it's the uh, rationals. And N doesn't equal negative one. Now, it should be kind of obvious why this formula doesn't work for negative one. So let's see if, if, if somebody out there can kind of guess why this doesn't work for n equals negative one. I'll give you a hint. The universe explodes when you use negative one. So why, why is that? Um, and I'll get back to that. So there's a special formula though that you can use for certain conditions. Um, we'll get into that later. But uh, for right now, n equals negative one does not work uh, for this particular power rule. So let's see how this power rule actually works. So if I take the integral of two x with respect to dx, then I, I have to take this coefficient here. Now this coefficient here is in, it not seen, right? It's called an implicit rather than explicit, right? So implicit, there's a one here because x to the first is x, right? You guys remember that? So if I take one plus one equals two, and then I have to put it in the, as a coefficient in the denominator. Now I write things like this. I don't, I, you could write it as x squared over two, right? You could, right? I write it this way. Right, and this, this is basically one half x squared rather than x squared over two. When you do Taylor series, you'll, you'll generally write them out as x squared over two, factorial in a Taylor series, but still. Um, but you, when you, you generally, I generally put the coefficient very explicitly, okay? Yeah, division by zero, exactly. Division by zero, if you have negative one, n equals negative one, you get division by zero because one plus, negative one plus one is zero and the universe explodes. We don't want that. Um, all right, so I write it like this. And by the way, even if this was an improper fra fraction, right? Even there's something like um, five over two. It, this is one thing that bugs me in math. I remember growing up, and maybe you guys remember, they, they always told you never to have improper fractions, right? They wanted you to have mixed fractions, right? So you, you, if you had something like um, three over two, you would write it as one and one half, right? Right, so... They didn't want you to have improper fractions. Why? That Stop doing that, teachers. There's nothing wrong with improper fractions, right? There's nothing wrong with them. Leave them alone. They didn't do anything to you. So if you have five over two or whatever it is, that's particularly it's perfectly fine. Don't worry about it. Uh, but this is how I particularly write it. And you'll see this a lot, like, for example, like one half NV squared, right? Which is the formula for kinetic energy, right? You don't see it generally written that often as MV squared over two which is perfectly fine, right, same thing. But everybody knows that to physics, kinetic energy is one half mv squared, right? Or if you if you kind of go into what's called Lagrange, um, it, it actually, the symbol is T. Don't ask me why, for a million dollars, I still could this day never tell you why. The Lagrange formula is, is what is it, T minus U, right? <laughs> right? T minus U for kinetic energy minus potential energy. I, I don't know why. Um, Weird, uh, but that is, that is the case. T is actually your kinetic energy and U is your potential energy, but. All right, so anyway, so this is gonna be one half X squared plus C, right? Oh, I forgot the one half here. I don't know why, but. Uh, wait, see here. Yeah, wait, wait, uh, what did you hear? Oh, you know, this is two here. I'm sorry, this is two here. Yeah, I see my mistake. I see my mistake. Uh, one sec. 
fix this. I, I was like, hey man, there's a mistake here. Ah, so check this. This is two over two, right? Yeah, because you're bringing the coefficient down, which is one x, right? You guys didn't catch this on me, huh? Didn't catch you didn't catch it, did you? Huh? Nobody caught that. See, I did that on purpose. I was testing you guys. All right. So this is actually uh, uh, two over two x squared, and two over two is equal to one, which is just x squared plus c, right? Does you guys see that? Because if I take the coefficient, which is one, I add one to it, and I get. Uh, is that right? No, it's just no. You're right. No, you're right. There we go. Yeah, because if I bring this down, it's gonna be two. Uh, no, wait. Oh, you know what? Yeah, it's just this. I see what I did. Uh, I'm gonna fix this. Real quick. Uh, I got this. I got this. Uh, there we go. There we go. Is that fixed? Is that better? Yeah, it's just 2x plus c. Right, okay. Yeah, so the derivative, uh, antiderivative of 2x with respect to dx is going to be basically just x, x squared, right? Because I'm adding one to the coefficient here, right? Oh, no, I had it right. I had it right. Yeah, because, because if you put 2 into the denominator, it just makes it equals 1. Yeah. Uh, I can fix this. I will get this right, I promise. Uh, that is equal to 1 over 2x squared plus c equals... Yeah, that's right. That ha no, uh, no, 2 over 2. No. Is that right? Uh, 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 where am I making a mistake here, guys? Two, so 2 in the denominator. Right to bring that down to x. No, it's got to be two over two because it's got to go to way to one. There we go. Yeah, yeah, that has to be the case, right? Yeah, yeah, because my two is in the numerator here, right? So two x, and then you bring the exponent down to the denominator, right? We're two, so I have two over two x squared. Two over two is one, so I have one x squared. So x squared plus c. There you go. Yay! See, even though you do these things a million times, you still like. Easy to get confused, right? All right. Yeah, you just you just pull the two out as front easier to see. You're right. You're right. Um, that's that's another way to, to do that. You can pull the two out. Um, this this two right here. There's a rule. You can pull the two because it's a coefficient across the integral, right? And just take the integration of x, which would be x um, x squared, and then put the two back. Or me, no wait. Uh, how would you do that? Uh, uh, what do you mean, John, by pull the two out? I'm pulling it out here because it's it's two x, right? So I have the inner, I have the exponent here too, right, which comes from one plus one. Then I actually take that in the denominator, right? Because this is like two, one plus one is two, so two goes in the denominator. I have two in the numerator from here. Two over two is one. I'm left with just x squared. There you go. That's it. All right, so we can actually check that. Uh, the derivative of x squared plus c is equal to the derivative of 2x plus the derivative of c. This goes away because the derivative of c is 0. I'm left with just 2x. So if I, if I take the integral of 2x, I should get x squared plus c. Then if I take the derivative of x squared plus c, it should give me back the original function of 2x. Yeah, 2 is just the multiplier. Yeah, yeah, that's just the coefficient. All right. All right. So evaluate 5x cubed with respect to dx. Right. Yeah, I mean, you can pull it outside the integral sign. I, I get into that later the, as one of the rules that you can pull it outside the integral sign. Um, but I haven't got to that rule yet. So, so let's say we want to evaluate five x cubed with respect to x. Right. So using the power rule for integrals. Right. Uh, these are all real numbers. Right. And x doesn't equal one, so we can definitely use in it. Hey, hey, Rumpus. Hey, we got a real physicist out there. Oh, good, he can keep me in track here. 
so basically, uh, we have here m plus one, which is going to be the exponent is three, right? So given three, three plus one is four. So we know the exponent is going to have to be four, right? So that's kind of a given. So using this formula here, right, we we can rewrite it with the putting the information in with this type of format. So I know it has to be x to the fourth, right? Because it's x to the third. I add one to it, I get x to the fourth. So how do you figure out the coefficient here? Well, the original formula, again, I'm not gonna be pulling outside the underground right now. Again, you'll learn those rules afterwards, but right here you have five, right? And five divided by the exponent in the numerator is four. So I end up with five over four, x to the fourth plus c. Now again, as Rumpus and everybody points out, yes, you can pull the 5 out and put it across the integral sign here and then bring it back in, right? But um, there's, just, there's just no reason to right here to try to explain to people. <laughs> Ax axes. <laughs> now Rumpus is making fun of my, my speech impediment. Yeah, the axis. Um, all right, so... This is how you would do this particular problem. Like I said, the integration of 5x cubed dx, we end up with 5 fourth over, uh, 5 over 4x to the fourth with, with the constant. Again, this is a family, a general solution, right? So it's a family of integrals for this one function, right? Because again, we don't remember, we, we don't know what the original constant was. All right, so let's get into some of these rules and, and some of these things that you're probably eventually gonna have to learn. This is, the, this is called the sum rule of integrals. Again, you'll see these written as functions here. Um, again, nomenclature, right? So don't get too fixated on the nomenclature. Um, it, it's not that critical. But basically what this is saying is if you have two functions that are added or subtracted with respect to dx and you're trying to take the integration of it, then you can actually separate them. So if I, end, if I have the integration of fx plus gx, I can separate those and have the integration of xx, fx with respect to dx plus uh, integration of gx with respect to dx. Make sure you put the, the dx in there. That That's really important. You have to know what you're integrating with respect to. If not, you're going to be integrating the wrong thing, right? So you got to know what variable you're, you're actually taking the integration for. So to give an example, um, now again, you can easily add this to get 5x, right? 2x plus 3x, everybody knows is 5x, right? So I can easily say uh, the integration of 5x. And yes, you could take the 5 and move it over here. And, 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 and change it around that way. But again, not going to be worrying about that. I want to show you guys uh, basically how you can use this particular rule, right? So this particular rule, if I have, in this case, 2x would be the fx, 3x would be the gx, and I want to integrate that, I can say I'm going to integrate 2x dx plus 3x dx, right? I'm just going to add these two integrations together as opposed to integrating the 5x. And it should be the same, right? Because 2x plus 3x is 5x, right? So this should equal this. So let's find out. So uh, if I'm going to be doing it this way, and again, this is what you'll see sometimes. When I integrate this particular formula, the, the integration of 2x with respect to x, I end up with 2x plus some constant, right? Right? Because whenever you integrate, you end up with a constant. Now, Eventually you stop putting these in and you basically just do it mentally and then you add a C at the end. This is how I do it. However your instructor ever wants you to do it, right? But I mean, the conceptually wise, every time you take the integration of something, you end up with a family So here. So 2x is gonna be x squared plus some constant, right? And then you're gonna, you just, I just use some, some one as an as a indexical, right? This is index for that. So if I take the derivative of 3x, or excuse me, the antiderivative of 3x dx, right? I add one to the exponent, which gives me two. I also bring that two down to the denominator, so I end up with three over two x cubed. That's something like, I'm sorry, three over two x squared, plus again, some other constant, right? Which we'll call that c2. So I end up with x squared plus three over two x squared plus c. And here, c is just the value of c1 plus c2, right? So it doesn't matter. Um, you just add, add the constants together, you get C, you just track the concepts together. It doesn't really matter. Whenever you're working with constants like that, you just represent it as one C. So this, this at the very end, this C that you'll see down here represents all these constants combined. That's all. So don't get too hung up with putting the constants in when you're working the problem. Again, 
Somebody might tell you differently. I don't bother with it because it's just most of the time when you read about this stuff, it doesn't have it in there for this very reason. It just gets cumbersome, and people already know that there's a constant in there. So there's really no no reason to. All right, but you would think that the x squared 3 plus 3 over 2 x squared plus c should give you the same result if you just do an integration with 5x, right? Right? So if we if we actually did it this way, if I if I had common denominator, right? If I made a common denominator, which is going to be 2 over 2 here, because my denominator for 3 over 2, by the way, we, we, we did this the other day in one of my other videos, right? We explained how to define uh, lowest common denominator. So in this particular case, my, my common denominator is 2. So on the x squared, if my co if common denominator is 2, I got to put 2 over 2, right? Because I it's 1, right? So I'm not changing anything. I'm just changing the base here and adding, I'm just putting in 2 so I can add these together. So now I've got something I can add together. 2 over 2 plus 3 over 2, right? Because x squares are the same, right? So this is apples to apples. So if this was an x cubed, you couldn't do it, obviously, right? But x squared plus x squared, so 1x squared plus 1x squared is 2x squared. So 2 over 2 plus 3 over 2 is equal to 5 over 2 x squared plus c. And that's what you would get if you integrated 5x, right? Because x here, you have the exponent of 1. 1 plus 1 is 2. You bring that 2 down to the denominator, and I input 2, 5 over 2 x squared plus c. So this is the same way. So this, this kind of shows you that the sum rule of integrals works, right? Woo, how are, we, how are we coming along so far? Right? Have we, have, we, have we all, like, lost our minds yet? All right. So here's a problem that, that you don't even need to do any work in your... In, I mean, yes, you should always show your work. But this is a show that you can actually do this in your head. Right? I didn't include any work for this. Right? I literally didn't include any work for this. I just basically said this is equal to this. Boom. And you could do it in your head. And let's, let's find out kind of why. Let's go through these terms. So evaluate this, this, all this with respect to dx. All right. Now again, everything between this sign here and the dx is what you integrate. Um, you might actually see it like this if you really, you know, want to make sure people knew what you, you meant. Right. You might see it like that, which is fine. Yeah, you could you, we, we, yeah you could simplify things using the constant property of integrals. I, I think I actually mentioned that in here. I, I get into the uh, constant property of integrals. Um, I, I show people that rule, so I, I think it's further on down here. Um, but I want to do it step by step to show that how you know conceptually these things work. So again, to integrate this in your head is pretty easy, actually, right? Again, show your work, but if you need to do it in your head, just do it in your head. Okay, well, um, four plus one is five. Bring the f 5 down to the denominator. There's, a, there's always a 1 here, right? There's always an implicit 1 next to any variable. Your coefficient to any variable is 1 if not explicitly stated, right? So there's an, expl there's an implicit 1 here. So if I bring the 5 down, because 4 plus 1 is 5, bring the 5 down, I end up with 1 fifth, x to the fifth, right? Same, let's go to the next one, x third. Well, 3 plus 1 or th uh, is 4. Bring the 4 down to the denominator, I end up with 1 fourth, x to the fourth. Okay, now again, I'm just doing this in my head because I know the, the, the sum rule of integrals, right? I know that the integ integral from plus over pluses, this doesn't work for p multiplication, by the way. Don't leave a way to do multiplication. We'll get in that next video, or one after, I don't know, but don't do this for multiplication. This is only for addition and subtraction. Make that very clear. Um, so minus x squared would be, uh, this would be minus x squared would be basically two plus one is three, putting the three down the coefficient, one third x to the third, don't forget this is a negative. Um, 2x, right? x to the first, so you have 1 plus 1 equals 2. Bring that down here, 2 over 2 is 1, so I'm just left with um, x squared. And this was kind of interesting. Uh, 3 integration is going to be 3 minus 3x. Can you guys see how that got that, though? Because there's no x variable here, right? But the, deriv the derivative of 3x is just 3. So the antiderivative of 3 has to be 3x, right? So there actually is an x here that you can have, but it's x to the 0, right? So if I wrote 3x to the 0, it's the same thing. Because x to the 0 is equal to 1, and 3 times 1 is 3. Interesting, right? Uh, again, concepts. This is, this is the thing about math. Um, you, you learn things precept by precept, right? You learn things by bit by bit. And so every time you learn a new course, it generally brings something from another course that you took, 
right? Like I, when I took college algebra, and we learned about first derivative tests, and we learned about doing concavities and, and inflection points and relative maxima and minimum, all this other stuff. Um, that draws into learning stuff in calculus, right? Um, just do a four-year transformation. Um, yeah. Um, I would love to do a video on Fourier transformation one day, although I barely understand them. The only thing I know about Fourier transformations, if I recall, is that when you're trying to take something from the frequency, frequency domain to the time domain and use a winding frequency, right? So you, you have your frequency, then you have, you plot it on a circular graph, a two pi circular graph, and you want to match your winding frequency to your um, actual frequency so you can draw out the, the, the component parts of your, your your wave, right? So if a wave is a summation of multiple different waveforms, like let's say you take two tones and you put them together, like 440 hertz and 480 hertz, they're gonna blend together to form a new frequency. A Fourier transformation allows you to, to put them around a winding frequency to determine what two summations will give you the formula for that original um, functions that you have going into making the mixed one. Right, so converting the frequency of the domain to the time domain. Did I explain that right, John Park? Because you're trying to quiz me here, and I'm doing integrals. You know, but what do I know, right? Yeah, what do I know? Did I, did I explain it halfway properly? Because Fourier transformations are nuts. Because the formula for it is crazy. Um, I mean, sure, you can you can derive the formula and explain the formula. It uses an um, exponentiation, but uh, yeah, that's that's some complicated stuff. But uh, yeah, let me know how I did on it. For, again, I, I just do intro stuff, right? I'm not deep into this stuff. I haven't taken calculus in 20 years. 30 years, I don't know, but yeah, whatever. But I am curious if I explained that pro properly, John. All right, so anyways, this right here is basically this, the evaluations of this, right? There you go. And you do it in your head, right? And then you go, oh, integrals are easy because I can do this in my head. This is probably 0.0001% of what you learn in calculus. I mean, this is like... <laughs> Calculus gets so hard so quickly. Uh, it's, okay, so anyways, but at least you get the uh, the, the, ju the, the, the gist, uh, gist of it, right? So, all right, so it's important to know what you're integrating with respect to. Again, I, I want to talk about the concepts. So given that you have an integration 2x with respect to d, right? And you remember that x, this is why this works, right? x to the n over x to the n is simply x with the exponents minus each other, right? So if you have like x to the third minus x to the n, it's just basically three minus two or x to the first, right? These are rules of exponents. So in this case, n minus n is zero. So x to the zero is equal to one, right? In a nutshell, this is the easiest way to, to think about it, right? So um, there, are, there are some exceptions to this. Somebody will eventually ask, well, what about if x is zero? Um, look, x to the x to the x, zero to the zeroth power, Look, I, I, it's undefined, okay? It, this doesn't work for that particular thing. Yes, zero, I think zero raised to the zero power. Some mathematicians, from what I understand, will make that equal to one. However, I don't know, the, I don't know what, what it's for, why. Zero raised to the zero power, as I learned it, is undefined, okay? You guys can do more research on that, but anyways. So this doesn't work if, if, if this is actually zero. It's actually undefined. Uh, but the integral of two at t with respect to t, uh, there's look we we want to we want to find the antiderivative with respect to the x variable, right? So it has nothing to do with t here if t is time. So we are doing an integration, and again there's a, is an implicit x zero in here, right? Because that's just one because two t times one is two t. So I could take the integration of two x to the zeroth power with respect to x. And I end up with two t one over one x to the one. Again, this is a conceptual thing. I've I've never seen it really written this way. I, I really just made this up. I, I honestly did, but uh, it, it works. So I I think this is the easiest way to try to explain it. Is that my coefficient here is one, my exponentiation is one, leaving just x. So that leaves me two t x plus c. Right. So my antiderivative two x two t with respect to dx is going to be. 2tx plus c. The t doesn't change here. Nothing changes over here. The only thing I'm doing an integration with, or the antiderivative, is with respect to the variable x. La, la, um, la Hospital's rule, um, that that's, you can use for integration when you have, let's say you have some limit of your function going to zero in the denominator, you can use La, la Hospital's rule 
to determine if the limit exists at that particular point because there's a lot of different ways of determining whether a limit exists. There's, there's different steps you can take because certain functions are very difficult to determine whether a limit exists because if it has a discontinuity somewhere, um, if, it's not, if it's not a continuous function, then you can't differentiate it at all points, right? Because there's no time rate of change at a discontinuity or a, what some people call it a singularity, right? A singularity event is a discontinuity. So yes, a hospital rule can be used to try to find the limit of a function when you have things like uh, zero in the denominator. Like if you have like um, approaching from like one direction of x plus one, where you have it approaching negative one. Well, obviously the limit there for negative one plus one is going to be equal to zero, which you can't do, right? So you can't have you can't have the zero in there. Um, so there's different ways of doing that from approaching from the left, approaching from the right, using hospital's rule, which I barely remember, but sure. We, 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 I did a, I, I'm pretty sure, did I do a vi video on limits already? I think I already did, didn't I? I'm pretty sure that I did one on limits just before I did one on, um, on uh, summations. Yeah, when the values are undefined, right? But you're going to be undefined when you have a discontinuity, right? So if you have a function that has some discontinuity in it, that has a place where there's a break in the function or, you know, it's zero, um, then, then that's the only time that the hospitals will work. All right. All right, so let's give some practice here. Um, but again, what do I know, right? You know, I'm just some guy off the internet that people think that uh, I just do, you know, Young Earth Creationist videos and stuff, anti-Young Earth Creationist videos. I did actually take some science and math at one time, believe it or not. I don't get a chance to talk about this stuff often. That's why I, I guess I do these math videos. One, is good practice for me. And, and two, I think if I can explain it after, what, 30 years after being out of nuke school and college, because by the way, yes, I took um, many years of college. Um, I just didn't finish, but I have enough credits for a bachelor's. I just didn't finish, which is fine. People can condemn me for that. But I did take physics. I did take math. I did take calculus. I did take a lot of this stuff. Um, I took a math fact uh, college algebra from Texas A&M Extension College. Um, so whatever. Um, do you do the limit definition of the derivative? Yes, we actually had it to derive um, from first principles, right? So the limit definition of a derivative is derived from first principles. Um, yes, we actually had to do that, John. And actually, I, again, I think I did a video on that, if I'm not mistaken. Um, Kino, I did not. Thank you. Uh, did you see my comment? Thank you. I did. I, I, sorry, I did not. But thank you, Kino. I love you. Hope all is well with you. Uh, Matt, another mathematician friend, Josh, is out there. Sorry you're late. It's okay. We wind from the beginning when you can and watch from the beginning. Uh, let me know what you think. Uh, he always critiques my math videos. And I appreciate that, Josh, because he is an actual mathematician. I am not. I'm just somebody who eh, tries to explain things because, again, the reasons I do this is I think that if I can understand it, anybody can, right? Uh, well, okay, there's certain people out there that probably can't. But you know what? Like flurfers and uh, maybe a few other people, choice people. But we're not going to get into that. So, yeah, Josh, let me know what you think of this video. If you start from the beginning after all this is done, I appreciate it. But all right, let's so kind of move on here. So practice. Given... The, um, the derivative, now this is actually the derivative, right? So the derivative of x, 2x2 2 plus 4x minus 9, find f of x, find the original function. So if I know the derivative, to find the original function, or at least the family of functions, I need to take the antiderivative, right? And by the way, it was Josh's idea, thank you, Josh, to start off with indefinite integrals, right? To explain them as antiderivatives. So hopefully this will, you know, I, ho I hope that he's actually approving of this because again, it was his idea to actually to start with indefinite integrals. It makes perfect sense to me as end of derivatives before you get into getting into definite integrals and a proper integral versus improper integral and then you know fundamental theorems of calculus. So yes, please leave a, a comment in the video section uh, once this is over what you think, Josh, and if you notice any uh, mistakes. And if you're mean to me, I'm going to block you. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> All right, no, please critique critique away. This is like I said, integrals are my bane. So this is probably not my favorite video to do. I was much more comfortable doing limits and, and summations and some other stuff, derivatives, right? Uh, integration is much more difficult. All right. So, anyways, so I want to find the original function. So the the, the integral of the derivative of x with respect to dx is what I'm looking for here. Um, so again, my integral uh, with everything in here between the integral symbol with respect to d dx, I could break them up individually, right? Using this sum of integration, right? So I will say that the integration of 2x squared dx plus some constant 
the integration with Forex DX is, is um, some constant and the integration uh, 9 DX plus some constant, right? Um, actually, there's no one, this is negative 9. Fix that. All right. Uh, so what am I just doing here? I'm just breaking these apart, right? Again, not if there's multiplication signs here. Don't do that or division, especially if it's in the denominator. Once you start doing integrations where you have things in the denominator and radicals, it's a whole game changer. I mean, it's just a lot more complicated. That's where you start getting into integration by parts and, 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 and value, variable substitution and having to do really kind of look at integration charts to determine how to actually do the integration, right? Um, I, I did, we did study, yeah, I did take Ryman definitions of integrals um, and, and also Newton's method by determining, um, by taking slices, right, for the area. But again, that was a very long time ago, Immutable Destiny. But I do vaguely remember the Ryman definitions of integrals, but I don't have it memorized. Um, but I think it was at the time when we were doing uh, Newton's method. All right, so let's just continue on this. So, okay, I'm going to take these integrations. So uh, x squared is going to be 2 plus 1 is 3. Bring the 3 down the denominator, 2 over 3, x cubed. Okay, that's easy. Um, here is going to be 4x. x is going to be plus 1, so that's x squared. 2 to bring down to the uh, denominator, 4 over 2 is 2. There you go, so 2x squared. And here I have 9, um, was it x to the 0, which is going to be 1. So x to the 0 plus 1 is x to the 1st, which is going to be x minus 9x plus c. So, the, so Oh, I don't know why I put this as a little case here. It doesn't really matter if it's capital or not. I just like to be consistent. You might see these as lowercase. It doesn't matter. But as you can see here, the only reason I put these constants in here is just to show you guys, right? Normally, we've, again, Josh is a mathematician, so he could probably tell you. A mathematician is probably not going to put these little Cs in here, these, these indexical Cs. It's just a waste of time. They automatically know that in the, inter, in the intermediate stages, there's going to be constants. And at the very end, you're going to have a C. So you can actually probably get away just fine with not putting these C's in there. I, I've seen it, most of the time it doesn't have the C's, right? So when I've looked into integrations, it'll have it like this without the C's, even though you know there's a constant of integration, right? I'm not gonna get into the integrations of trig functions. <laughs> I mean, maybe I will eventually. Like I, you know, I remember the basics, like cosine and negative sine and, and negative sines, cosine and whatever. Um, I, pro I would have to do some serious review of trig substitutions. Uh, because they get complicated really quick. And I got to tell you, that was the hardest thing I did in calculus um, is, is um, trigonometric functions in calculus. Very, very difficult. Uh, I don't think I had a good conceptualization uh, during that time what really trig functions were doing, right? It wasn't until later on in life I was like, let me see if I can actually try to understand this better with using a unit circle. And kind of thinking things a little bit differently of how sine and cosine interrelate to each other um, and other trigonometric functions, right? Like arc, arc, arc tangent, which is, you know, inverse tangent and uh, that kind of stuff. So, yeah, I, I think the way it's taught in schools, at least the way I was taught trigonometric functions, confused the hell out of me. Straight up. It, 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 trig by far is my worst subject of all time. And, I, and I, I'm not trying to say this as an excuse, but I do kind of blame partly in the fact the way I was taught. Right. So, yeah, you know, and, and John says, yeah, you've got to put the C, which, by the way, makes it wrong, uh, because, again, you're coming up with a family of solutions here. Um, but as, as Josh points out, you normally want to put the C1, C2, and C3 in here. Again, I'm just trying to show you the concepts, but um, it does. It, normally you wouldn't. You just put the C at the end, right? All right, so moving on. So this is what you guys were talking about earlier. This is the constant multiplication rule. This is, and by the way, this is very similar to summations. In summations, you can do the same thing. You can draw the, the, the constant across the summand. So here I have some integration of k uh, function with respect to dx. I can draw the k across, right? So if I have the uh, integration of 2f to the x dx, I can draw the 2 out to here, right? So let me show you how this would work. So if I have the function 4x cubed plus 3, okay, right? Um, and I want to take the integration of that. So I'm taking 2 with respect to the f, x, uh, uh, f of x. I can just draw the 2 out here, right? Instead of multiplying the true across all this, right? I can, I can easily substitute this in for the function. I can multiply true across it. Eh. Sure, it comes out the exact same thing. But one of the easiest ways is draw the true across the integral symbol. Do the integration, right? Which is going to be um, 
here, four x cubed, three plus one is four, four over four is one. So that goes away, leaving you know one coefficient, which you just don't show, uh, which is x to the fourth, and then three x, because the x to the zero is x plus, zero plus one, so I have end up with x to the first, so three x, and then, then I can distribute. This is called, by the way, this is called dist distribution of multiplication over addition, right? Really fancy name, but that's what this actually is, is distribution of multiplication over addition. So you have two times four x, which is two, x plus four, or two x to the raise of the fourth, and two times three x, which is six x, plus your constant of integration, right? Now, you could do it that way, or you can multiply to, you know, do that first, and then find the integration, and it'll come up the exact same thing, right? So, there you go. All right, moving on. Sorry, I need some coffee. All right. All right, so, so what happens when you have integration with negative exponents where n um, doesn't equal 1, okay? Um, this is kind of a little thing I decided to throw in here because it's only when you have negative 1 there's a problem, right? If I have integration of x over uh, x squared with respect to dx, right? This is kind of interesting how this works. Remember that you can rewrite... Uh, uh, one over something, the reciprocal of x squared as a negative exponent, right? And by the way, a couple people have pointed out they wanted to have a video on negative exponentiation. I probably should have done that, but uh, if you don't know how to do negative exponents, what it basically is for a one over x squared, it's the same as saying x to the negative two, okay? That's what a negative exponentiation is. So I could rewrite this where, n, by the way, where n doesn't equal zero. Um, because again, what happens here when you have x, 1 over x to the 0, right? It is a, a, well, actually, let's see here. Um, yeah. Yeah, just because it just makes it 1 over 1. There you go. Um, so n, n over, over 1 to the uh, n, I can just rewrite that as the integration of x to the negative two, right? So the reciprocal of over uh, reciprocal of x squared, one over x squared, I can rewrite as the integration of x raised to the negative two with respect to dx. All right, so let's use the power rule. So if I have the integration of x negative two, and I want to use the, the power rule for, for integrals, I subtract, no, sorry, I, mean, I add one to the exponent, right? I add one, which makes, 2 minus 1 plus 1 is negative 1, right? Because I'm adding a positive to a negative. And then I'm bringing the exponent down to the denominator. And there's already a, a, a there's already an implicit 1 here. There's already an implicit 1 coefficient. So I end up with 1 over negative 1. Right? And 1 over negative 1 is just negative 1. So I end up with x to the negative 1, which is a reciprocal, right? That means the x is in the denominator with a coefficient of negative one. So the integration of, of one over x squared with respect to dx is actually negative one over x plus c. Pretty cool, right? Pretty cool, right? Is that cool? So you end up with a negation, a negative sign. You still have a reciprocal. You still have a one over x plus some constant. Now, this doesn't work with negative one, okay? and we're not going to get too much into this. This is kind of where my presentation is going to end here. I want to keep it under 90 minutes if I can. But the power rule for negative 1 is this. The integration of x to negative 1 is, is the integration of 1 over x with respect to dx is actually equal to the log natural log of the absolute value of x plus c. Now, you're going to be like, wow, wait, wait, where, where the heck did they get that from? Yeah, it's crazy. Um, but it's actually not. As a matter of fact, um, there's a lot. you are definitely realize what it is when you start taking... Physics, like we, we, you know, I took nuclear physics, so we use a lot of natural logarithm stuff. Believe it or not, re energy uh, decay rate, excuse me, uh, radiological decay rates, and things dealing with energy and things dealing with uh, um, natural functions, E, come up ubiquitously in physics. I mean, it's just prevalent everywhere. It's ridiculous. And so, um, what's happening is this: is this. Let me see if I can switch this over real quick. Uh, let me bring up my Desmos real quick. So, what's happening is actually this. Let me get rid of all this. So this is the LNX function, okay? This is the function for LNX, your natural logarithm, right? And 
if you notice, if I take the absolute value of x, right, if I take the absolute value here, where it approaches from the left and approaches from the right, I get an asymptotic behavior here at zero, right? It means approach, I mean, it just goes on to infinity, which means that zero here is undefined, right? Just like we would expect. If we have zero in the denominator, right? If I have, when n equals negative one, I have negative one plus one equals zero, when I use a power rule, that makes it undefined. Well, what happens when I have asymptotic behavior going on the y-axis here? I get undefined, right? So this is why for that particular function, it is undefined, right? So this is why for um, one over um, x, you have an undefined value when you try to integrate it, right? Now, a couple of interesting things is that um, if you actually look at the e function, right? You might see, by the way, if you see something like exp, Something that means e raised to that power, right? You'll see it written out exp, but that just means e is raised to some power. So exp, you know, and then some function means e is raised to that function, right? You'll see a lot, a lot of mathematics exp. But this, if you notice, this is just this is just the mirror of this, right? So it, you probably might think to yourself, oh look, the natural logarithm ln is the reciprocal function of e, and it, it, you would be right. Be the fact that if I take if I take the nat here if I take the natural logarithm Oh, by the way, Desmos hates this. I don't know why, but check this out. Desmos, Desmos loses his mind when you try to do this, but it is correct. I noticed this the other day. But the natural logarithm of e to the x is just x. They, they basically, for all practical purposes, cancel each other out uh, because it's the, it's the inverse function. So ln is taking the inverse function of e to the x. So if I want to find out, if I want to just get the exponent of e raised to some power, I can take the natural logarithm of that, and that just gives me the exponent, right? Because it's the inverse but I don't know why Desmos does this. I don't know if you guys have the same problem, but Desmos does not like the fact, I mean, there's an infinite amount of, uh, number of X's here, right? I mean, I get that um, because X meaning any value, but it's just, it doesn't like it, it loses its mind. Um, so if one thing you should also notice, um, which we might get into another time, I talked about this in Taylor series, but the derivative of E to the X is actually E to the X, right? This doesn't show anything, but the derivative of E to the X is actually E to the X. And so the second derivative of e to the x is e to the x. The third derivative of e to the x is e to the x, right? Interesting. And also, the, again, the integration of e to the x here, again, this doesn't show anything, but, um, and by the way, the, I, I don't know how, to, I've seen Desmos actually have a, a visible thing down here. It says visible, and you actually can graph it, um, an integration and show the, the area under the curve. I haven't been able to figure out how to do that with Desmos. Leave me a comment if you know how to get the, the where it says visible here. Um, I've had to do it by actually, like I said back here, like to figure out this area under here. I actually had to do a, a, a inequality here. I actually had to like say, well, y is greater than this to act as a boundary conditions, right? So luckily I knew how to do that, but um, there's actually a way to do the integral where it actually will give you that, and I don't know how to do that. I, I, my Desmos doesn't do it, so maybe if you guys can help me with that. But anyways, if I take the integration of e to the x, it's, it's just e to the x plus some constant, right? Right, just some constant. But you, you're 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 gonna you probably just find it written like that. But it is with some constant, right? Which is kind of cool because when I did Taylor series, um, I kind of explained that, right? If I have y as a function, right, as an independent variable of e to the x, right, then y is going to be equal to e to the x when e to the x is equal to this expression here, right? Which is the summation of n, which is some natural number zero, to k. Um, and basically, it's, it's, it's actually taking more of a limit, right? You're going, you're going to infinity here, of x to the n, n factorial, right? And you're, you're, what's, what's, what's just doing is it's taking a Taylor series, right? This is actually a true expression right here. See this one right here? It doesn't like this, but this is actually what it is. And I, again, I don't know Desmos too well enough to know why it doesn't accept something like this, but this is correct. Um, because k is approaching infinity. Um, but you can have it like k. But basically what it's doing is saying that for each iteration, for each step here on the Taylor series, right? If I plug in zero as the n value for uh, zero factorial, which is one, x to the n, which is one, right? So as if n equals zero, then this function, excuse me, this, this fraction here is equal to one, right? So this is my first number in my Taylor series, right? Um, and then as, as, as n goes higher, like n equals one, I end up with one factorial, which is right here, as, as two, two factorial, and, the, and in the numerator, I have, or so the, yeah, the numerator, I have x to the first, x to the second, this is your Taylor series, right? So e to the x expressed as a Taylor series is going to be this big old whole long thing for infinity. And this is where it gets really cool. After each iteration, 
it approximates this curve, right? This this curve right here, more and more. Like my first iteration is just this, right? right? My first iteration at k equals zero is just this. What happens when I hit one? Okay, now it forms a tangent line on that particular function. All right, a little more closer, right? I have now have one plus x over one factorial. What happens when I go to two? Oh, oh, I get a little bit more approximation of this particular function of e to the x, right? Right, it's, it's, it look, it's, I mean, it's bending around here. x equals, k equals three. Oh, now I got some real contour there. It's approximating it even more, right? So as I add terms, like right now I'm up to k equals three. So zero, so zero is my first term, which would be one. Now it adds x plus, uh, x over one factorial. Here it adds x two over two factorial. Here it has over, you know, x third, three, x to the third over three factorial. And each time it approximates this particular function closer and closer and closer and closer until you reach infinity. In fact, let me see if I can actually. Let me see if I can actually see this uh, stepwise. Is it anim animation? All right, so why am I in negative numbers there? I don't want to be in negative numbers. But anyways, you get the idea. So every as I my approach as my k goes up, right, to infinity, it's going to actually be the actual function. This is why this is summation. Um, it's a it's actually a limited approach as k, but um, e to the x is equal to n zero to k of my summation of a Taylor for a Taylor series. And this is what the Taylor series is actually doing. It's just approximate. And so if I add another term here, here x to the fifth or fifth factorial, I'm gonna get a closer and closer approximation. So anyways, that, that's, why, that's why we use uh, summations. That's why we use integrals, find areas of the curve. This is why we use approximations. This is how math all, you know, kind of blends all together, right? Because this Taylor series here looks really complicated, but all it is is approximating the value of e raised to the x. And if x equals, you know, some value, x equals one, then, then you get e, right? Right? If x equals one here, right, the Taylor series remains the same, but the values are going to be closer and closer to 2.6 whatever. Because each time you add a, a new value to it, you're going to be closer to the original function of this. Right? So as my slider changes, So if this is, uh, yeah, it does much doesn't like that. I gotta add the slider. But anyways, you get the idea. So let me get rid of these because it's going nuts. My Desmos does this, and I don't know why. I have no idea. Yeah. Anyways, you get the idea of how to do an approximation. That's that exactly. That's exactly what's going on when you're doing a Taylor series. Well, I kind of want to explain to you guys real quick that only because it's intricately related to this power rule here, right? A long way to get to back to the beginning is that this power rule here is because you have a discontinuity at negative one, right? So you can see that visually when you when you're looking at the logarithmic function, the natural log uh, of x. So absolute values means it comes in from both sides. You can actually see that as approaches from the left, it has an asymptotic behavior to infinity at, at uh, y equals zero. And then as it approaches from the right, same thing. So there's a discontinuity there because you have no limit, right? The limit doesn't exist at zero because zero is undefined. And matter of fact, it's actually by definitions, if you are undefined, if you have division by zero, it is, if I'm not mistaken, it's actually a definition. By definition, you cannot have a limit there, right? Anyways, guys, that basically is it in a nutshell for introduction to um, integrations and definite integrals as, as antiderivatives. Uh, if you guys want to see something else when it comes to derivatives, let me know. Leave me in the comment in the comment section. If you want me to tackle definite integrals, that's fine. Um, it involves a little bit more dealing with fundamental theorems of calculus, which is fine. I think that wouldn't be too hard for people to do. Um, I'm not going to get into the trig functions of integrations or derivatives because... Yeah, <laughs> not going to happen, at least not for a while. I would have to remember that stuff myself. But I hope you guys learn, learned something on this. Um, if you've never been exposed to this before, if, if this is all second nature to you, hopefully I got it right. Again, this is probably not 
a topic that I'm super comfortable with, with integrations. Uh, but I think I, I try to explain in a way that, look, this is how I understand these concepts, and hopefully other people will as well. And that there's a, there's a majestic beauty of mathematics that just relates a lot of things together. Like exactly like, like my presentation I did in Cal 2 Taylor series, um, it, it, just, it just shows how, how awesome it is when you just have a mathematical formula that starts approximating stuff more and more and more until you get to the original function. This is why we have summations. Um, and the same thing here is that you'll be using summations to add areas underneath a curve to find the integral or the area under a curve between two points, two boundary conditions, or you know, whatever boundary conditions you are, um, and find the area inside under the other curve, right? Um, to get a definite integral. And so we use that a lot in physics. We had, a, like for example, people may ask, where does this come into practical things? Um, it does, it it, when, you, when you learn about nuclear reactors, you have what some call, something called the Carnot efficiency. And you're learning about different processes that go on with expansion of steam enthalpy and entropy and and there's a diagram that's being formed and, and based on your efficiency uh how much energy you're going to get out of the system how, or how much more specifically how much work is being done by that that system and if you ever look at a carnot cycle the actual work of that system is actually equal to the area underneath the curve on the bottom of the carnot cycle right so there's a there's a direct relationship between mathematics and physics very direct relationship, right? Um, I could tackle, I could try doing, see, I never studied triple integrals, to be honest with you. Um, I do know what they are. Triple integrals are just basically when you have three, three vector quantities, right? If you have three, three things you're looking at as far as uh, something in three-dimensional space, right? Then you would have three vectors, three, three integrals, because so, you're integrating with respect to each one. So I could probably figure it out, but there's so many different rules for triple integrals. Um, I, I don't know them, to be honest with you. Um, and I and I would really I, I don't know think I ever want to tackle things like Maxwell's equations. Um, I mean, yes, I've looked at them and I understand um, basically the basic concepts. I mean, I understand like del time. What is it? Del times action um, it is one of, one of the very simple things for the principle of least re principle of least uh, action. Um, but yeah, I don't th I don't think I'd be very good at doing triple a integrals. I mean, that's a little bit out of my ballpark. But um, anyways, guys, leave me comments what you think. I do appreciate you watching. Um, I know these videos, these math videos, don't get a lot of attention, and I'm cool with that. I don't do these things for, you know, views. Matter of fact, I don't even have my channel for views, contrary to what people believe. I, I do this stuff because I enjoy it. I like talking about these topics, and if people want to watch, that's great. They want to become Patreons. Um, I appreciate that immensely. I really do. That's what I survive on is my Patreon. Um, and members, right? If you have that join button, but if you want to become a patron, leave it in, you know, become a patron in the, in the video description. I'm going to be doing more of these types of things. Uh, but if you like the content and you think that it is providing educational content and you've, uh, that we have the discussions you want to have, then think about becoming a patron um, and send it to friends to at least subscribe to the channel. Um, because again, I want people to view this not because. Uh, you know, it's for views. I want people to view this because it has decent content and maybe somebody might get something out of it. Because I love when somebody writes me and goes, man, I never thought about that way before. I, you know, when I took this in college, they didn't explain it this way. They didn't, they didn't make it so you can conceptually understand these things. And they're right because a lot of times they don't, right? They just don't. So anyways, guys, thanks for watching. Like I said, I appreciate if you become a Patreon. I appreciate if you hit the join button, become a member. And if you, if you don't, that's absolutely fine. I appreciate you sent, just watching. But try to send this out to people. Um, again, I like people watching more of the math stuff than anything, even my um, like shows, only because I think that there's much to be, be you know, gotten from learning a little bit of math, right? Because I think it makes people a little bit more um, understanding of reality and how, how there's some overlying concepts that relate physics and maths, right? So, yeah, I, I, I mean, I did Matrix the, not too long ago, John, um, and one of the questions Cheshire asked was a great question is, like, when would you use Matrix, right, for, for doing um, linear transformations and change of coordinate systems, right? And you're doing transforms. You So, yeah, I mean, you want to do... I, I mean, I could probably do more on that one of these days, John, because we had to take, um, you know, like, learning about what's called echelon form, um, and your identity matrix to determine your um, um, your 
determinants and to figure out how to solve for a system of linear equations by using matrix theory. Uh, Gauss-Jordan elimination method, right? Uh, that's some pff, challenging stuff. But yes, I did take that. Um, I could I, I could do a video on rectangular to polar coordinate system. That's actually pretty easy. I could probably recall how to do that pretty quickly. I've, I've done that numerous times back in the day. Um, I don't know the how many people would care to learn how to do rectangular to polar. Um, but if you want to do, if you suggest that in the in the video description, uh, Sav, Sav, Savanil, um, by all means. So, so make some suggestions in the video description, and I will see what I can do. Okay. Um, all right, guys, I'm at the 90 minute mark. That's where I wanted to end. So, once again, thank you very much for watching, and uh, we'll see you probably later on tonight on uh, Over and Under with Chris Atley. Good night.